It was a beautiful, beautiful Tuesday morning, much like today. Awakening, the sky was blue, the leaves were beginning to change, and, and the air, in a sense, started to become more crisp. As I walked from the parsonage to the church, it felt like fall was ready to, to come. It was a beautiful day, a typical Tuesday day, day, that I was headed to the office when I was met by a phone call from Janet. Janet had said, uh, turn on the TV. You've got to see what's happened in New York City. And so I went and we got to the TV in the office and, and we looked and as we watched, we couldn't believe our very eyes what we had seen. First, there was the, the plane that hit the ten, twin, one of the Twin Towers. And for many, they assumed what had happened in the sense of why would a pilot this and, and run into that. They thought it was a horrible accident until moments later it was the second one that hit. And then people began to fear what is happening, what is going. We were, we were a nation that was at peace in the sense and a beautiful fall time, and yet what we were experiencing was something that we had never seen before, never dreamed of ever happening to us. Soon there was word that a plane had crashed in the Pentagon, and then there was one that fell from the sky in Pennsylvania, all wondering what had happened, and the suspicion continued to bring about fears that there was planes falling into the, from the sky, and we had no, no idea what was causing or what was behind all was going on. When you watched the television, they would replay and replay and replay over and over again the planes crashing into the, into the Twin Towers. There were those who, analysis, who were trying to make sense of it all, some of them saying that this is a plot, saying that this is something that's going to be carried on throughout our whole nation, that, that soon there was probably one that was going to be landing and, and, and into the Golden Gate Bridge. And so it was panic and fear in our nation. While I was in the office, I received a call from the high school principal, Ray Murray. Ray called me up and said, Pastor Steve, would you please come? Well, Ray wasn't a member of our church. He was a Roman Catholic. But he said, would you come? I just need you to walk the halls, to be around, to bring comfort, to be some strength. So I stopped what I was doing and went and raced to the high school. And it was pandemonium. It was chaotic. As parents were rushing to the school, wanting to, to get their children, it seemed as though the... the Left Behind series had, had fed another fear that this was the end times and that suddenly as planes were falling from the sky, the world was coming to an end and parents were wanting to have their children to be close with their loved ones. And I didn't blame them. I too had no clue what was going on. I could understand them wanting to have their, parent, their kids close because we had no clue what was going to happen next. As I entered in, I told Ray, I'm here. What can I do to help? And he just shook his head. I don't know. So I decided with the help of the school counselor to try to, 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 try to get the parents who were there who were shouting for their kids at the desk. You know, that it's, there's just usually a few people that are working at the school desk and they were asking and demanding that they have their kids. And we said, please, your kids are safe. Let's form a line here. Let's, let's get things in order. We will see that your kids are brought to you because the last thing we wanted was parents screaming for their kids to come, to come home with them because who knew what was going on and none of the parents knew what class the kids were in. In fact, the kids were all in the same room they had been early in that morning and they were just watching over and over again as the planes hitting the Twin Towers. Once we got some kind of a semblance in there, I left, I left the, uh, the counselor in charge and, and, and we were able to get some calm by reminding them that their kids were safe. I decided that I was going to walk the halls just to see what I could do. As I walked, it was very eerie. As I passed each room, the televisions were all on the same station. They were playing. 
all that was going on in New York City and the analysis that was going on by the news people over and over again. They were hearing and seeing the, the planes crashing into Twin Towers. As I walked down the hall, you could hear it and you could see there was the teacher in the front and the students were all looking closely as if they were mesmerized to watching the horror that was developing right before their very eyes. As I walked, I prayed. I prayed for our nation. I prayed for our leaders. I prayed for the victims. I prayed for the students. I prayed for myself because I didn't know what I could do to help. But it appeared as though God spoke to me as I made the round and I began to realize that I was starting it all over again. I went to Ray, the, the principal, and I said, Ray, we've got to stop. These kids are just watching this over and over again and it's just raising their level of fear. We have to tell them to turn the televisions off, even if it's just momentarily, just for a bit of calmness and quiet, to assure them that they're okay. Ray said, that sounds like a good idea. And he sat down in his chair and he was able to get on his phone and get himself into the PA system to ask if the teachers would please, please, Turn your televisions off. We've seen enough, I think. Nothing much has changed. We will keep our eye on the television here in the office and inform you if there's anything else that we need to be concerned about. If there's decisions that are going to be made about early outs and about what to do. And I've got Pastor Steve here who I've asked to say a prayer. And I was shaking. What do you say? What do you say at a time like this? As he had the phone, answer, uh, passed the phone over to me, I said, is this okay? And he said, today there are no rules. It's okay for you to pray. So I said, like, got my hand on the phone and put it up by my ear and my mouth. I said, kids, I want you to make sure that you're sitting down. To allow yourself to just be in a bit of quiet time. To rest and take a deep breath. For what has happened today is, is terrible. What has happened today that we, we never knew would ever happen and never dreamed. And so we're automatically going to be afraid. But you're okay. You're here with your friends and teachers who want to take care of you. You're safe now. I began to pray as if I was taking an inventory of the things that were happening that day. To pray and ask for their silence, to be thinking of these people, those in North City, and in Washington. Those who had been on those planes and lost their life. The victims who were in the Twin Towers. we praying for the first responders, the police, as well as the firefighters. That in the quietness and stillness of this time, even though a thousand miles away, it was holy hell. But to be quiet, to think of those. And then I asked them to turn themselves in, inward, to pray for themselves, to take a deep breath and know that you are safe, you are secure. Tonight you will have a home to go to, people who will be waiting to see you at home. And then I just close the prayer asking that God will be with us and with the nation as we try to make sense of it all. I actually cannot remember a single word I said, but as I handed the phone back over to Ray Murray, his, his eyes were filled with tears. As he sat back down in his chair and he took a deep breath and he said to me, I don't know what to do now. There is nothing, nothing that is 
in our books, anything that will guide us through a day like today. That is what 9-11 and what I remember. After, in the sense of helping them get to the lunch period, everybody's got to eat. I went off to the church and I decided that it was time that us, the pastors got together and the churches got together. And so I called all the pastors and I, I said, hey, let's get together at 3 o'clock this afternoon and let's figure out what we can do as a community. So 3 o'clock we met and decided at 7 o'clock we'd have a service at the Luther Church. It was the biggest church in town. It had the largest parking lot. We kind of decided how the service would go, that each of us would have a part, and that we would spend that mostly time in quiet prayer. Because none of us had answers. None of us were sure about what was going on. There was still a mystery about all that had happened. But we sensed that people wanted to get together. At 6.30, the church was full. We started opening up classrooms. We put people wherever we could. There was standing room only. And it said to me that on a day like 9-11 is a day that we need each other. As I look upon that 15 years ago and today, I don't remember a day in my life where I saw a place where people were unified as they were on that day, looking for opportunities to, to be with one another, whether it's with family or with friends. It was incredible. If I learned anything 15 years ago, was that I realized that we all need to be together. We have a need for each other. Yesterday, when Jan and I were returning um, from, from visiting our grandkids, um, we, uh, we pulled by the parking lot and she said, well, why are all these cars parked here? And, and she's, I said, well, the kids went down to Adventureland. And uh, there were a lot of cars there, so I'm hoping that there were a lot of kids that went down. But it reminded me of about 30 years ago when I was a kid, pastor, and I took our youth group to, to Adventureland. And I was so proud of myself that I was able to keep up with them. I rode all of the roller coasters, I rode the tilt the wheel, I was on that thing that swings, it's a ship, I forget what it's called. And then we got to what was called the silly silo. Doesn't that sound pretty lame, the silly silo? It's like we were in the kitty department, I thought. And they said, come on, Pastor Steve, let's get on the silly silo. So I'm, I'm running up, remember I was 30 years ago, and I'm ready to get on this thing and... I get in, and it's round, not very big, and there's nothing to hold on to, no belts to, to buckle up in, and suddenly they lock the door behind us. I figured out then that I had made a big mistake. <laughs> there was no escape. And suddenly that thing started spinning around and around and faster and faster to the point that you were spinning so fast that you were plastered against the wall. George Thornton had shared that he was just on that 30 years ago himself. And I said, oh, you could tell everybody that you went and got plastered with a pastor. <laughs> but there you were, and you, were, you couldn't move. And suddenly the floor of that thing starts to go down. And you were going around so fast that you are held up there along the wall plastered against the wall, being held up, and you were spinning so fast that you can't even move. The young fellow from our youth group, he saw the look on my face, and my face was up like this, and he said, don't worry, Pastor Steve, it'll be over soon. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they don't have that ride anymore, and I, I really think, and I, I, I'm, I'm sorry to gross you out, but I just believe that they got tired of clearing, clearing up all the throw up that was in that thing because that's what I felt like doing when it was finally done. My head was spinning for hours after that, that thing. But if any of you have been in an event, whether it's as, as eventful and as tragic as 9-11, 
or been in a part of your life where you have lost a loved one, or been in a car accident, or something tragic has happened, it feels as though the world is spinning too fast and you just want to get off. As if the bottom has fallen out and there's no place to stand, no place to go. And that's what 9-11 kind of felt like. And we were dizzy with understanding of what was going on and trying to make sense of it. And it seemed as though we had nothing to stand on. So in the midst of that, we realized that we needed each other. We also discovered that we need to pray. That night when we gathered at that church at 7 o'clock, as I said, it was standing room only. And people came because they just wanted to pray. They wanted to be with others. And what I discovered on 9-11 is the fact is that we can pray anytime, at any place. And truly, God must be able to hear us even before we're ready to pray, as I thought of those people out of desperation who were trying to escape the falling towers, those who were literally jumping out in order that they would not have to die such horrible deaths. And God heard their prayers of desperation. Even if it was just two words, help me. And so we need to pray. And we need God. What I learned 15 years ago is that we need God. For weeks, our services were full. People were attending because they needed each other. They needed some kind of sense of grounding. And they needed help. And knowing that they could trust in the God who would be there. When we read Psalm 46, in the midst of that is a beautiful little statement about a river that runs through the city of God. And as I was reading that and wanting to know what that all meant, because we, we've been to Jerusalem, I'm trying to think, when they say the city of God, they're usually talking about Jerusalem, but Jerusalem is on a mountain, there's not much in the way of a river that runs through it. What that meant. The beautiful thought, but I was trying to make sense of it. When I looked at the the interpreters, it was talking about God's presence that flows in and through and with throughout all of our lives. A presence that gives us strength and encouragement. And that's what we find in we turn to God, is that presence that gives us strength and encouragement. Like Psalm 46 begins, our God is our strength and our refuge our help in every time of need. And so whether we're standing at the side of a grave of a loved one, we can turn and know that our God is our strength and our refuge, our, our help in our time of need. We get that phone call in the middle of the night that our dear loved one has, has died or there has been a horrible accident. We know that our God is our strength and our refuge in our time of need. Or if there's a change in our lives, the loss of a job, a friend, a loved one walks out of our lives, a change in location, we know that our God is our strength and our refuge. And never change, and never need help in our time of need. Fifteen years ago, I learned something on a day that changed our world, and changed our nation, and changed me. I learned that we need each other. I learned that we need to pray. And I learned that we have a God who is our strength, our refuge, in our every time of need. On this day that we come to remember, let us not forget for it was one time that we felt this unity that brought us together, whether it was our faith, whether it was because we were neighbors. But let us learn from one another and from this day and never forget. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, as we pause on this day, that 15 years ago our world was forever changed. 
our nation's thoughts were redirected. Suddenly we found ourselves facing an enemy that was able to destroy the very livelihood of our lives, to take away the things that we took for granted, such as our safety and security. And so, gracious God, we pray. We pray that you will continue to work towards peace, to work towards that place where our children who, who this is history, will grow up in a place where they can feel secure and safe again. Unite us as you united us 15 years ago, that we may find that way of bringing us together as we seek to find that we find much more in working together and serving together than we do in our differences. Bless us, Lord, in our work as this church as we unite together to serve you and to show your love to others. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.